What if I were to suggest that you play a key role in the awakening world? And that you are watching this because you have heard the call. We can start right now by opening our hearts and minds. Welcome to the awakening world. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to The Awakening World. I'm your host, Scott Katamas, also known as Love Coach Scott. And this is the start of a brand new series of programs we're going to do on The Awakening World. We are celebrating unsung heroes creating the new paradigm. And I'm really delighted with our first unsung hero that you're going to meet in a few minutes. But I want to welcome everybody who's with us. First off, all of our friends here in Zoom. I see Jeffrey and Karen and Susan and Mary and oh, too many people that I can name, but it's great to see all of you. Let us know where you are geographically. I know, I know by now where you all are from, but Reverend Bridge doesn't know that yet, so it's kind of fun. And I also want to thank John and Summer Raymer for having us out on the Sign Network. Do you know the Sign Network gets us out to as many as a hundred? different Facebook groups and pages. So if you're watching on Facebook or you might be watching on our YouTube channel or on Ellen Steinfeld's YouTube channel, I wanna invite you to actually come on into our Zoom room. And it's really easy to do that. Just open up a different browser um, and go to globalpeacetribe.com, globalpeacetribe.com. And then what you can do is down here, see where it says register for the current season. And what'll happen is you'll get the link in about 60 seconds. Um, you'll automatically get the link to tonight's show. But you'll also get the links to all of our shows. We do three shows every weekend, um, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday. So for example, uh, tomorrow, um, we've got this Unsung Heroes program continuing on. So it's gonna be a wonderful way to join us and I am going to go right into music with our beloved brother, Omashar, to open our hearts, get us started. And then I'm really looking forward to introducing you to Reverend Bridge Feltist. Beloved hello. brother, Omashar. Hey, aloha. Um, namaste to everybody. How awesome to be here tonight. And uh, we had, um, I'm in Colorado and we've had a few days of 96 degrees and it dropped to 72 today. What happened? It's like, no, we've not winter already. So anyway, I'm going I'm to play us a warm song and it's called uh, The Tear That Lost Fear of the Ocean. And uh, it kind of speaks for itself. Um, the ocean, of course, is divine consciousness and the tear is us. So here it is. Here it is. Press a button. And action. Deep breath.
When flowers grow Dripping with dew And rivers flow In sapphire blue I suddenly know What a fool god I knew I'm a tear What's lost fear Of the ocean And when autumn sun Kisses my cheek Whilst cool winds come From the mountain's peak With combs on my tongue And no wish to speak I'm a tear It's lost fear Of the ocean I'm a tear It's lost fear Of the ocean In sweet water Will I give you my heart Already start to feel better, my sweet water. Won't you send me your love forever and ever and ever, forever and ever and ever. Whoa. When tender hands. Trace memories where powdered sands meet temperate seas. I don't understand, but I love mysteries. I'm a tear, it's lost fear of the ocean. And when evening stars shine all around, my grieving hearts no longer down. And things that were lost, that's where true hope's found. I'm a tear, it's lost fear of the ocean. I'm a tear, it's lost fear of the ocean. In sweet water, when I give you my heart, I already start to feel better. My sweet water. Won't you show me your love forever and ever and ever? Sweet water, when I give you my heart, I already start to feel better. My sweet water, won't you send me your love forever? Thank you so much. So welcome. <laughs> so grateful for how every show um, and providing so much music. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Are you actually? Well, you actually the next is, you know, I'm sure this is the first that we're doing. Celebrating. You're breaking up. You're breaking up really. Wow, uh, okay. I can tell that that's. So uh, not bad, really uh, broken. So you have, you, have to, you have to pat me on the back again. It was all broken up. <laughs> <laughs> Am I back? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I think hopefully it was just because I was downloading uh, a, a beautiful video about Reverend Bridge. You're good now. So, may have been it. Okay. So again, thank you, Amishar, for being with us every week and blessing us with your music. And this is a special night. We are kicking off this new series of celebrating unsung heroes. And um, the woman you're about to meet, some of you have seen her before because she's been on the show a few, three times before. I am so impressed with how she manages teaching about very hard stuff. And she does it with love, she does it with compassion, and she does it with wisdom. And for, um, of course, I'm talking about Reverend Bridge Feltus. But rather than just hearing me 
singing her praises. I just was downloading this video and I want to play it because it's a good introduction to the woman we're going to spend our evening with. Let's take a look. It's important to know that this course changes people's lives. Every area of human experience is impacted by white supremacist, cis heteropatriarchal, settler colonialist, imperialist, capitalist society. A lot of times when white people, especially in spiritual communities, talk about social justice or these conversations, in general around race or sexism or violence against women or discrimination against people who are disabled, they deflect by saying, oh, well, that's victim mindset. They're not quite getting that we're trying to have a conversation. Being a part of the conversation is like right there, those words, I'm a part of the conversation. I, I'm, I'm with a community of people who are engaging in really hard, hard and important topics, relevant, practical, you know, crucial topics. And the impact of that is that my system is feeling community, it's feeling co-creation, it's feeling connection, it's feeling a, a sense of belonging, you know, belonging is really important for me. Before this class, if I saw somebody being treated differently because of their color, I felt bad, but I didn't know what to do with that. Now I know what to do with it, and I will do something with it. I was so moved, angered, and shocked that it really took my breath away. I was also angry that there were a lot of things that my education had gaps in. Five, six years ago, I believed that racism was like Nazis and KKK. And over the years, and, and definitely since doing this work, uh, I get that it's a spectrum. I get that, you know, I'm a white man. I happen to be of Jewish descent, and descendant of Holocaust survivors. And, and I benef continue to benefit from being a white person. I have been born to the dominant and race as a person who's white. And a, a, a polite racist. I, I think I wasn't fully aware of how cruel humans are. I, I think there was an innocence about me that assumed everyone had the same drives that I have and to really confront cruelty, specifically to target one group of people, but then that permeates out into all of the other. There. there is social justice work that occurs to me as performative. You know, it's like when we talk about a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion training, where they tell you what to say and what not to say. To the voices of the inequality and inequity and being able to accept the necessity of those voices being heard, regardless of how angry they might be. Um, being able to understand that that anger comes from a place and has a place, or at least needs to, in order for change to happen. I really think her, the coursework that she's designed the pieces fit together in such a way that the learning, the internal learning and synchronization of different parts of yourself come together naturally. It's really a beautiful process. To connect with people on a deeper level, to have more compassion, more empathy, more love, that's definitely been a result of my participation in, in this course and this work. For me, it wasn't a one and done. It's something that I'll continue to unpack and unfold as long as I get to be a part of the Remember Institute. I look back, I see the me before I took this course, and I, mean, I know that's still me, <laughs> but so much has come into my attention. The blinders just get removed 
slowly but surely revealing so much more. And the impact of that is being engaged in, in life. What I'd say to someone who's curious about taking this course is the ideas that they have in their imagination about what they might receive or what they might be capable of doing in this course will be far exceeded by the actual capacity that they will gain from being in this course. The freedom and liberation that they will experience internally from the old conditioning that they have will give them access to a whole new set of possibilities and a whole new awareness of how to run their life going forward. I'm learning very quickly to pause and reflect on what I, the way that I'm interacting. When I'm using this word racist or, or supremacist ideology, like they can be really subtle inside of myself, right? Like I don't consider myself and have never considered myself to be overtly racist or supremacist. That's based on what's up here in my own mind on what those are. And so really taking a step back and listening to the perspectives of people who have had experience of being oppressed by those dynamics and then allowing those perspectives to influence the way that I'm looking at myself so that I can get real-time feedback inside of myself and not continue to perpetuate those in the relationships that I have. A result of that in, in real time right now is that like the majority of the friends that I am in like direct communication with and like sharing experience with on a day-to-day -day basis are people of color and we get to talk about these things and, and it feels like I'm getting to heal huge aspects of myself um, that I didn't even know were wounded prior to taking the course. So we're very grateful to be doing this work and I'm proud of what we've done so far. We're two and a half years in and uh, we're just gonna keep building. So as many of you know, my uh, partner on Friday nights with the Straight Talk Show and then coming into the Awakening World is Trish Wright. And Trish first discovered Reverend Bridge, um, took her course, and it completely changed Trisha's life. And then by proxy has impacted me as she brought Bridge in. And I also had, I never before meeting Bridge would have thought of myself as having inherent racist thinking. Because I, like most of us, I see myself as a spiritual guy, as a good human being, as a good man. I've done lots of multicultural programming. I've done lots of, I've done a lot of integrated stuff. I've always hired people of all color, I'm a good guy. But Reverend Bridge, with a lot of compassion, has helped me to understand a whole deeper level of, of my privilege as a white man and inherent ways of thinking. And now all of a sudden, I notice it more. So with no further ado, our first unsung hero of the Global Peace Tribe, I'm really happy she's with us. This is Reverend Bridge Feltus. Scott, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you. And thank you for the great work that you're doing. And I, you really find this razor's edge of, of making it safe for us okay. to look at the shit we don't want to look at and the stuff we well, didn't know, right? I'm glad you said it that way because we actually don't do that. We, we, we don't at all. In fact, one of the things I remind our community of every day is that we are not putting a lot of attention on a safe space, on making a safe space. And first of all, with me as the, the center of that community, as its teacher, it's and I'm surrounded by people who are racialized as white, it is never a safe space for me. Mm -hmm. And so I have to come into it as a, bra a brave space. So that's what we foster is brave space. Everyone shows up. We know that sometimes things are going to be said that might offend or might rub people the wrong way or might trigger some trauma or pain. And we stay in it together and we talk things through and we actually appreciate the reflection that we are exchanging with each other. And, and so that, that first piece about safe space, um, I, I don't actually even know what that is. It really, for most people, is very um, subjective and means something different to each person, right? So we, we have, I don't know how many people we have, 20 some odd people right now on our call and 
there's no way I could know what would make each of them feel unsafe. So what I would would invite people to do is show up as their whole self and self-aware and to be observant of the way that their body and their mind processes what's being said and 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 what they're saying so that um we show up in intimacy with each other um intimacy is not safe <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it, it's not and and the the ways that we try and keep things safe we keep each other in the dark or or um we keep each other ignorant of what's really happening and so um I'll give you just an example. Um, the other day, one of our community posted um, a meme about a, a white man named Whipple, who was one of the authors of the Declaration of Independence. And of course, this document is about independence in this country, but it's also independence from Britain, from the UK. And so uh, the meme was t telling how this man, he, he helped to author the, the declaration. And then he, um, it says that he, he, he freed his slaves. He freed his, slave, his slaves because, um, what did it say? he freed his slaves because he changed his mind and decided that slavery was, was terrible. And I thought to myself, I don't re recall that being the correct story. And so I looked it up. It took me about five minutes to Google the man's name. And lo and behold, he actually did not free his slaves. He kept them um, for nine years beyond the time that he authored, uh, co-authored the Declaration of Independence and released them in the year before he died. And the slaves that he had, he had them for 30, 40 years. And um, <laughs> he, he did not, he was ill at the time that he released them and signed their, their papers so that they could be free. It was nine years later, he didn't actually release them until he was about to die. And so I, I went back to this post and I, I asked the gentleman because he, he's a part of our community. I asked him what was his motivation in posting that post? And of course I already know <laughs> because I've seen this so many times. Like why, why does a person in a, in a group where the topic of conversation is about dismantling and disrupting racism. And we talk a lot about the history of white supremacy and all, all different forms of marginalization, of course. And so in this group, why would someone post um, something in, of that nature without checking it first, number one? But secondly, what is the emotional thing that they were expressing there. And so we talked about it. And what came out of that was that he was, he's in this conversation with me and in a very dismissive or, or um, almost like a condescending way, feeling as if I must not know any good white people. And so his motivation was to prove or to show that there were some good white people. Now, this is someone who's been in our community for quite some time. They know that my husband is born in Salt, uh, outside of Salzburg, Austria. He's very, very white. <laughs> and that I have many, many white friends. And that, of course, obviously, um, I'm not completely oblivious to the fact that there is a full range of people on this planet who have varying motivations and agendas. So this was almost like a, well, what we call apolog apologizing, apologists 
um, in, in these conversations where someone doesn't want to actually put their attention on the painful stuff. And so I we had this conversation in our community group. And I'm sharing this because the next thing that happened is he felt embarrassed. He felt ashamed and didn't want to take in the feedback, even though it was really like I'm talking to you right now. And um, he accused me of shaming him. And what can I do about that? I'm like, look, we, you and I have a relationship and I'm giving you feedback about something we've actually talked about probably five, six times already. And it was discussed in the course and there are probably no less than three essays in the course about this particular topic of how in, in throughout history, um, we've been taught uh, to whitewash history and this puts the white male in particular in a, in a certain light. And um, for example, we have an essay in the course about Thomas Jefferson, who when I was in school, they taught us that he had a love affair with one of his slaves. Her name was Sally Hemings. But as a slave, you don't have consent. So how do we know that she was in love with him? <laughs> and there's nothing in, in any uh, written history that says that other than what we read in our history books. Um, none of her descendants say this about them. He was, he held her as his slave until right before he died. And, um, and her children, and the children he had with her. And as we well know, I mean, in today's climate, even just to be an employer and to have sexual relations with your, your uh, employee is considered irresponsible, right? Because you have power over that person and you're not meant to uh, manipulate or use your power to manipulate intimacy with another human being in that way. So we, we talk about these things and because it's, it's painful, it is, it is painful. Um, people will often feel uh, attacked or like there's a personal, um, I don't hold any of that. I don't hold any of that. It's not necessary actually for me to hold people in contempt for the conditioning that they have, that was that would be irrational because that doesn't fix it. It doesn't help anything, and I don't get any pleasure from that, right? So safe space. We don't do safe space. We do <laughs> we do brave space, um, and that means me too. Guess what? Uh, last year we hired uh, a trans woman, and I couldn't get the pronouns right. For, for months, I would miss represent their pronouns and it was embarrassing. And I, I felt really shitty about it because here I am, I'm teaching about um, inclusion and tolerance and um, respecting people's autonomy and sovereignty and their, their freedom of expression. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we talk about trans antagonism and all, all of these things. I'm told, I don't have any problems with trans people, <laughs> but I couldn't get the pronouns right because I have the conditioning about uh, around that. And we all have some kind of conditioning. If you're cis hetero, you have conditioning around uh, LGBTQIA+ in your system if you live in a, in a cis hetero society. If you um, live in a society that um, glorifies physical prowess, then people who have uh, any kind of disability, uh, they, we have conditioning. And in many cases, that conditioning has us be simply unaware. This is one of the most common ways that 
people are conditioned around racism, ableism, uh, trans antagonism, et cetera, is unawareness, being completely disconnected from the impact of your actions, your ways of thinking, and also the, the systems of government and the structures that uh, make up our society, the impact of those as well. If it's not affecting you and it's not affecting people you know, or people are not talking about how it affects them, or you don't know, it could be affecting you, you don't even know it's affecting you. And if we don't have the conversations, then you may never know. And things just stay like they are. I noticed, so gotta, I, yeah. I noticed in your video, uh, the, the gentleman, the white, younger white guy, who talked about that, about you know how in your course, he got in touch with some of his own pain um, and some of his own uh, issues. You know, So again, it's not just about learning about others, but it's ultimately it's about self-reflection. And yes. that's, that's how we learn is by self-reflecting yes. and, and learning in that way. So what sets us up for separation from each other, um, for uh, the loss of, of intimate connection with each other and empathy for each other are a few things. So uh, one of the things from birth, uh, her parents, I mean, at least my generation and older, our parents read us fairy tales where there was a, a villain and the villain was always slightly darker and maybe had a large nose. This is some subliminal anti-Semitic stuff in there. And um, oftentimes they were disfigured in some way. So like a hunchback or some other kind of physical ailment or disability or uh, disfigurement in some way. And this is how we begin to form our perspectives of what evil looks like. Um, darkness, the, the word darkness being used to describe evil, um, when darkness is simply a, a, an absence of light, it doesn't mean evil. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the absence of light is not evil. So, you know, there's this whole, I mean, we use the term black sheep, like it's nothing, but nobody ever thinks about why do we, why do we call that thing the outcast child or the, the person who stands out from the crowd in a, in a way that's derogatory? We call that, a, that person a black sheep. Why? What, what's wrong with the black sheep? There's nothing, there's nothing physically wrong with the black sheep. It's not deformed or it's, it's, it's not a, there's nothing wrong with that sheep. They just have a different coloring. <laughs> so there's all these little ways in our societies where we are programmed to think in certain ways using language and images um, that trick us unconsciously into developing biases and then in a split second moment this is what we see a lot of times with police violence um in a split second moment when you're in fear or um you have a quick decision to make you're using your bias usually you're not using your conscious discernment and so a lot of this stuff that we see in the news happens because people are not consciously aware of what their biases are so that they can disrupt them or dismantle them. So it's one of the things we focus on in the course. And um, listen, <laughs> it's interesting. I created this course specifically because I had a lot of white friends and those white friends around the George Floyd um, incident and also um, a couple of years prior to that, my cousin was murdered by, uh, he was arrested for a delinquent child support uh, payment that he had actually already paid. And because he couldn't pay for bail and it was a Friday evening, um, they took him to the local jail 
and then over that weekend held him there for a Monday arraignment. And he was a severe diabetic and they refused him his medication. Not only refused him his medication, refused him medical care. And then as he was dying in that jail, um, he he was screaming and, and the other uh, people in the facility were screaming and insisting that someone do something. And so they pulled him out of the cell in the middle of the night and hosed him down to try and get him to stop screaming. This was my cousin. This is the, the son of my father's first cousin. This is my family, my blood. And, and that actually happened. So I'm having all these conversations about that because my family needed to make this story public to try and get some, some legal support. And uh, the feedback, the things that people were saying to me is just mortifying. People that I'd known for years who regularly say how much they love me were um, insisting they, could, they couldn't believe it actually happened the way we said it did. We had actual video footage and they could not believe the footage. Well, maybe this or maybe that, but, but never actually just accepting that it actually happened. And so this started, um, <laughs> because this was very difficult, it's still difficult to talk about. Um, I decided instead of having all of these conversations one-on-one -on -one with all of these different people that I would save myself. <laughs> and I created this course. I was already creating Remember Institute. And I just took the principles and practices that we use in other courses and in my core work and apply it to racism and sexism and ableism and all the other forms of oppression and conditioning that we have around those topics. Um, yeah, it has saved some relationships and it has also ended some relationships. Um, so this conversation is one that, you know, for me is very personal. I am a brown skinned woman. I have Choctaw ancestry on my mother's side. Uh, so I'm part Indigenous American and um, African American on my father's side. And so, and I have a son who's 25 and he's beautiful and smart and very talented. And to see the, the ways that our society impacts my loved ones and knowing the privilege that I have, um, some of it hard earned, some of it because of my proximity to whiteness, because I have a white husband. I, I have to, to use my privilege um, to do this work. I've had the privilege of doing a lot of spiritual work. So I've worked through a lot of my trauma and uh, intergenerational trauma as well. And so I can be in this conversation without it taking me out completely or without feeling um, strong feelings of hatred or rage. And, and most black people would have a hard time with that um, unless they've done a lot of work. And that work costs me a lot of money and that money <laughs> came from privilege. There were a lot of sacrifices made for me to be able to be here to have this conversation. And so I show up and even with all of that, it is still a painful conversation. It's still, a pain, every time I have it, it's still a painful conversation because there's a human here. <laughs> and this human doesn't think that I should have to explain some of these things, right? And that's in me because I'm a human being and I have the conversation anyway, I show up anyway. I know that um, there's going to be things said that are insensitive. I know that there are going to be things expressed um, that are, um, well, <laughs> lacking the correct or true information. I know that these things are gonna happen and I show up anyway. 
And so I ask people to meet me here. And I think that's the first step, right? If you if you see me as your sister and forget about all of the, the rest of it, and you know that your sister is being treated unfairly and not just unfairly, but in ways that affect the core of her being. My mother and my sister both have hypertension and that hypertension, we don't know where it comes from, but I would tell you that from a very young age, what black parents tell their children is that they have to be twice as good, uh, three times as smart, four times as ambitious, uh, 10 times as hard a worker in order to get um, a fraction of the privilege that this society offers. So it's a very stressful life to live in a white supremacist society for black people. And it affects our health, high blood pressure, sickle cell anemia. All, all, there's a, a whole list of um, diseases and disorders that are more common in the population of white people, of black people or indigenous people. And you actually even see a difference between black and indigenous and uh, people from countries in Asia, because there's a whole, it's completely different dynamic happening there when people are not descendants of the Atlantic tra slave trade or the colonization of this country um, and the genocide of the native people here. Um, if, you, if you don't descend from that, it, you have a different perspective of a country like America. America may be a, a land of opportunity from your perspective or from your parents' perspective if they were immigrants. But consider this, um, if, if this land that we live on was occupied by millions of people before we got here, bless them. It was occupied before we got here. And, and then this idea of freedom and liberty for all was amplified across the globe in order to draw more worker class laborers to come here to work for the elite. And, and those people from all over the world wishing for a better life for themselves were willing to come to a stolen land full of the, the bodies of the people who lived here and to have that freedom for themselves. And so there's no, there's no one in this land um, who comes from, who's immigrant, who is not a participant, whether they're consciously aware of it or not. And, and no one wants to talk about that because you got your everyday life, right? <laughs> you got everyday life and you have your your everyday troubles and your everyday stressors and um we don't even realize how many of those even are a product of these uh social engineered uh oppressions um, i think that most of our relationship issues in this country or even across the globe are they have a lot to do with how we think about gender, for example. Uh, cis heteropatriarchy does that. Um, we are also socialized to be passive and aggressive. <laughs> so uh, we have a lot of a lot of conditioning that you might not think of as racism, but it's all under the same um, social engineering that has us be useful to the elite, that has us be um, energy mines for the elite. And so that's what I do. I work with people around being able to identify their own bias, being able to um, cultivate new ways of thinking and seeing the world around them so that we can all be more connected with each other and perhaps someday not be in this dynamic where we are treated and, and where we are treating each other as if our lives are not valuable. Oh. 
as Susan just wrote, you are truly an unsung hero. I just want to read a couple of the comments and then there's a question for you. Uh, Krista writes, when I listen to your story, I feel it in my body and in my heart. My question is, how do your methods support people to release this or to heal this? I'm so angered by the lack of consideration for basic human rights and healthcare, even including in a jail. So, um, so thank you for the question. It's a good question, right? <laughs> I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you what I teach is a, a collection of practices that people can use to sort of regulate their systems so that you can um, uh, be with the sensations that come up when you have these conversations or when you expose yourself to the truth of what's happening in the world. Um, slowing down, um, noticing ways that you uh, feel triggered or uncomfortable or avoidant of certain topics or ways that you might be passive within your own families or in social situations. Um, what are you doing? So usually we feel anger. And by the way, anger is not a bad thing. Anger is a healthy emotion. And you are designed, each of us is designed with the full range of emotions. We have access to every emotion and they all serve a purpose. So if, if anger, my, my uh, perspective is that anger um, is an ignition. It's meant to light a fire under us and uh, spark us into action. Perhaps, perhaps we need it to have the courage to stand up for ourselves. Perhaps we need it to have the courage to do something. We have to feel something strongly. And so it's okay to feel angry. In fact, if you're not feeling angry when you hear a story like that, hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, one thing I'd like to just get your take on um, is, you know, my day, my day job is as a coach. And mm -hmm. what my approach to anger is, is it's very appropriate to express anger for the purpose of being understood. I want you to know why I'm angry. I'm not, I'm not going to use my anger as a weapon or as right. an entitlement to right. shame you or make you wrong. But I do want you to understand that when this happens or when you do this, my reaction is anger. Because it, well, it's it, like an alarm clock. Right, exactly, exactly. And so if we can use it to understand <laughs> each other, but so often it's used as a weapon or it's used as an entitlement to make somebody wrong, shame, blame, judge, criticize. I would say that when, when what we're calling anger is used as a weapon, it's not really anger anymore. It's vengeance. And um, which doesn't really solve anything. And I'll say the same thing I just said. We have a full range of, of um, access to expression. We are designed that way. So I'm not gonna take any emotion completely off the table and call it invalid, okay? So, so with that said, um, anger is meant to be an ignition. You're not meant to be stuck in it. You're not meant to allow it to make you sick. Um, you're meant to express and then be activated by it. So what does that mean? Uh, to be in action, to allow it to ignite you into action. So what can you do when you hear about something um, that makes you angry, um, an injustice or a form of oppression, or you see someone who's being abused, what can you do? Well, I don't have all the answers for that. I know that too many of us are not involved in our political processes. Um, and here in California, it's something like a third of the population votes. Only a third? Yeah. <laughs> huh. 
And it's probably mostly all of the people who benefit the most, right? So um, other people, it's not set up so that people um, who have two jobs and children and you know don't have, can't take off from work and things like that, it's not set up to support that. Um, there's nothing, there's no, I can't recall once ever being educated about um, any of this, that the way that our voting system works doesn't really educate you about systems of government or any of that stuff. We get a little bit in school and then we're on our own. So unless you have the time to sit down and do all the research and find out who's, who's um, investing in that politician and learn who their relationships are with and what is their history, you have to take the time to do all of that. And all the money that's spent on campaigning that doesn't actually tell you what you need to know. So, you know, there's lots of things that can happen. There's a lot of change that needs to happen um, and, and it's happening. So it's not, it's not about, um, for me, it's not about hopelessness or um, that things are, are not gonna happen if you don't do something. It's about, you know, if, if you're not, uh, <laughs> I feel like there's, there's a couple of streams going in different directions here. And one stream wants to maintain the status quo and the other stream wants change. And some of the people in that status quo stream might even consider themselves to be liberal, might even consider themselves to be um, righteous in some way. And then you've got the change stream, um, which is full of people who um, the people in the other stream call divisive or uh, troublemakers or woke. This is the new thing. They've taken this um, a slang word from African American vernacular English and turned it into something derogatory. What it meant to us was that we have the intention to be in constant awakening, to not be ignorant, to educate ourselves, to be to pay attention and be aware of what's happening in us and around us. That's what woke meant to us. And now it's been turned into um, something derogatory, right? We have to really pay attention to what's happening around us and not be uh, what we think we're doing as being an innocent bystander or uh, being neutral or, or a centrist or whatever you want to call it, staying out of politics, um, not getting involved uh, because if, if you stay out of it, then you're above it. You're not above it. You're impacted by it. We're all impacted by it. And, and the things that actually do happen in this country um, happen because somebody stands up and pushes for it to happen. That's always the case. Whether we are talking, I mean, you can look at um, the division right now is kind of like um, you've got the Trumpsters and you've got the liberals, right? And the, the, the Trump people are riled up, they're on fire, they are angry and they're activated and they're using that. But what's happening over here? <laughs> All the so-called good people who are doing nothing. They're not activated, they're not, there's no motivation to do anything. There's a lot of avoidance. Like as long as it's not happening to me and I'm safe in my safe space. But what do you think that fosters? More dissent, more separation. The, the, the last month for me has been really challenging. My mom is ill and she's, uh, she's got a terminal illness. And we don't know how much time we have left. And it was a really hard hit to find this out. And I have these two friends who live in Denver, Colorado, two white girls. And they, uh, when, I, when I texted them and told them this, they 
they texted me back in the next morning and said, we're, we're getting plane tickets. We're on our way. Wow. Wow. So these are people I know are my sisters. These are people I know if um, anyone were trying to harm me, they would defend my life. They would defend the life of my child. They would do whatever they could to um, even the playing field for me if, if they have the power to. I know this about them because they actually demonstrate it, right? And then I have a lot of other people who say they love me who would not ever lift a finger, even though I do it all the time. So, and, and for me, I, I don't mean to say that as a tit for tat or like I'm keeping score because I'm not, it's my work to serve people. I get joy from that naturally. It's a metaphysical thing as within, so without, right? So, uh, but I do see it. I see that there are people who um, feel invested that my well being affects their well being, that who, how I uh, am able to move through the world affects how they are able to move through the world, right? And, and so I'm very much, um, inviting people to be more discerning and to learn that discernment because you have to learn it, which means unlearning the numbness, unlearning the averted eye, unlearning the um, sort of blocking out the undesirable news and actually getting into it and understanding what's happening here. So many people right now I know this is going to offend somebody. I'm, I'm not going to apologize. Um, <laughs> Queen Elizabeth was the longest reigning monarch of the UK. 70, was it 70 years she was? 70 years, yeah, 70 years. 70 years, 70 years. How many nations was the UK colonizing during that time? So I think I read that they have 26 colonies. <laughs> presently, that. presently. Presently, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you think about this and, and all of the atrocities, maybe you haven't seen the atrocities, but I do this for a living. So I know, I know what European countries did to countries of color. Um, in fact, any place that they landed on, they called their own because of uh, manifest destiny, they call it. <laughs> so, and, and we're not just talking about taking a land. America had millions of people living here. There were huge cities of people living here. There were actually already African people here living free amongst the natives. So, this idea that um, romanticizes the royal family, this whole fairy tale around queendom and kingdom and princes and princesses. What is this? And, and how quickly we watch the masses go into nostalgia mode. And I'm not, I'm not a, I don't, I'm not afraid of death. So I don't fear death. I don't uh, feel emotional about death. I, if it were someone that I am close to, I'm going to feel the, the loss of that person. Yes. I feel my mom's not even gone yet. Mm -hmm. And I feel it coming. Yeah. You know, and at the same time, um, death is what it is. It happens to all of us. And when we venerate someone, are we venerating them because of a fantasy? Or are we venerating them because they actually uh, did something in the world that was profoundly great? And does their great 
stuff outweigh the evil that they do? And if not, can we just be um, mindful of how much we fawn over people just because they are celebrity, because they are famous, because they hold this fantasy of imperialism that says that that one family is better than the millions of people who labored for their wealth over seven decades and beyond that. It was her great grandfather nations. And there are only five nations on the entire planet that have not been colonized by European nations. Only five. Five. Yes. Wow. That's yeah. a statistic I did not know. Yeah. So when we talk about um, <laughs> first world countries and third world countries, do we not see a pattern there? Can you think of one? white third world country there if if there are any i don't know them there are some that you might consider white but white european people don't consider white right so what are we facing what are we willing to talk about I think that's a good start is just having the courage to have the conversation in a, in a way that's vulnerable and to understand that um, people of color probably aren't gonna trust you without an established relationship. Many of them will be polite and friendly, but to say that they trust you with intimacy and uh, trust that you're gonna have their back or Defend, that you would defend their honor um, is a whole other thing. So we need these conversations. We need to have them. And those of us who are doing the work on ourselves on, on this side of things um, and are showing up for the conversation, we need you to show up. We need people to show up. Um, black people have been writing about anti-blackness since the 1800s. Black people have been writing well-known literature about racism since the 1800s. And there are poet laureates and Pulitzer Prize winners and bestsellers that um, have sold a fraction, for example, of what Robin DiAngelo has sold on her one book, White Fragility, which by the way, she got the information for that book from black professors that she studied with um, in African-American studies. And she charges something like $15,000 for a speaking engagement. And she's very successful, not because she's saying something new, because she's saying something from a white face. <laughs> she's right. saying the same things that I say, or that uh, James Baldwin said, or that Langston Hughes said, and, and all of these scholars and uh, poets and writers that have been around for centuries. Give them your audience. Don't be afraid to hear it from our own mouths. That's intimacy. I am, I'm so enjoying all that you're sharing, and I'm actually going to make a 
strategic decision. I'm going to stay continuing with you. And I think we'll briefly talk a little bit about Sharif, but I'm going to make that just a whole other show because there's so you're with us now and there's so much um, mm. that I'm appreciating. Um, and I also want to acknowledge some of the conversation going on in the chat box. There's been a lot of conversation about learning to manage your anger. And those of us that are uncomfortable with our anger, or learning how to come to terms with our anger, you know, the idea that anger isn't spiritual, but, you know, how to work with it. <laughs> right? um, anger, is, anger is extremely spiritual. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> any movement is spiritual. Any movement is spiritual. Um, you know, I believe that just about every dysregulation and disorder that humanity in the Western world uh, suffers from is related to this collection of social engineering, cis heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, um, and, and ableism, and capitalism, and imperialism. I believe this. And if we would actually educate ourselves about these things, then we begin to be a little more gullible. We're less easy to exploit. We become more uh, liberated in our expression so we can express what we feel and, and do it without trying to manipulate the other person. Like you can be more um, honest without um, trying to steer the other person. So I can say to you, I'm really angry without insulting you. I can say that, that thing you said really ticks me off. Mm -hmm. And I frankly don't wanna to talk to you right now, but I'm gonna stay here as long as you're willing to hear me out about why that bothered me. And, and I think that's fair. I mean, if we don't stop um, giving into the fairy tale, um, we are setting our, we're oppressing ourselves at this point, right? So this idea that you cannot, you're not allowed to be angry, that if you're angry, you're unhealed. Well, this is a lie. And we're taught that so that we will stay docile. Yes. Yes. And, and docility is repression. You're, you're full of, you're, none of us is powerless. None of us is without a voice. None of us is without um, value. But we're taught to, to be small, to be quiet, to uh, stay out of things that we've been told are not our business, um, that we should not um, think it's important to participate in our society in a healthy way. Um, we, we don't even just trust that this invisible company that made this product that you're putting on your body, just trust them. You don't know who they are. You don't know where the products come from. <laughs> like this food that we're eating, we don't know what's in it. We don't know what they're doing to it. Just We're just trusting. I mean, it's literally a part of everything that we do, every breath we take, the water we drink. We don't, we don't know what is happening around us and, and what we're putting in ourselves, mentally, physically, and spiritually. So yes, anger is healthy. Um, no emotion is meant to stay in your body. It's meant to be emoted. <laughs> the, 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 the word moat is in there, which is movement. It's meant to move, <laughs> right? And, and so, um, yeah, expressing your emotions is important. And also getting really good at discerning the difference between the emotion and the facts. Yes. 
I noticed that uh, George in the chat box talked about Marshall Rosenberg and mm -hmm. Marshall's my mentor. I traveled with him. We stayed in hotels together. I got to know him very, very, very well. And uh, he certainly has been the most significant influence in my life. And he talked a lot about that. I mean, that's a big part of nonviolent communication, which I know you're very familiar with. Mm -hmm. To differentiate between observations and you know, what, what our feelings are and our thoughts, you know, differentiating between our thoughts and our feelings. A couple of things, I want to read a couple of comments that have come in, and then I do have a, a, a couple of areas I'd like to go with with you. Yeah. Um, Karen Eisenberg writes, thank you, thank you, thank you, Reverend Bridge, for all you are doing to wake everyone up to these truths. I will do all I can whenever and wherever. I'm thinking of starting locally in my community first. Yes. Many are sheeples following those in power as if they don't know how to think, research, and discern for themselves. And, I, and a lot of people have commented, but I think Karen's comments reflect a lot of what's happening for some of our audience right now. I, want yeah, to I, don't, I don't think a lot of white people realize that they are actually oppressed too until someone calls them racist and, and or privileged. And then all of a sudden they can list all of the ways that they feel oppressed, but they're not doing anything about it. We have to do something about it. There, there are millions of us and there are thousands benefiting from us. So it, it's not about uh, lack of power. In fact, it is our power that is being mined. It is our power. That's why all these years, America has had this whole American dream uh, PR campaign that draws people here from everywhere with the promise of a better life. And a lot of people do have better lives here. And, and that keeps people coming, right? Well, that's changing now because it wasn't actually as simple as it was portrayed by this country and there's a huge cost there's an enormous cost every time i go around the corner to get my nails done i see the cost where there's uh 10 women from vietnam in this nail salon who aren't allowed to you they're not allowed there's no law saying they have to do this but they all have artificial American white names, Susie, Sally, Mary, Jane. And, that, and those are not their names. They come to this country and they've been ta taught to change their name because their names will be hard to pronounce. But we can say uh, Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> Or um, you know all the all the other European names that okay, my friend names. Mark Tanislavski right now. Mark is yeah. with us. <laughs> Mark, you don't have to change your name. No, but I'm I'm sure that his ancestors, if they if if he's not first generation immigrant, they were probably. Um, probably invited to change them. I bet you they were. Yeah, in my, my family history, when my father came over, he was Greek and his full name was Katamergenopopoulos. Wow. Thomas, yeah. Yeah. Nicholas Alexandrovich Katamergenopopoulos. And they changed it at Ellis Island, of course. So wow. that's like Katamas, which is very kind of just mm -hmm. all it is, is it, well, let's just cut it down to that. Yeah. Well, and, and, I want y'all to really understand something. White is not, uh, it's not an actual phenotype. <laughs> it's, it's not real. Yeah. And whiteness as a concept was created to separate people from each other and to categorize people from each other. Um, and it wasn't created until the 1700s. I believe it was Bacon's Rebellion when the uh, white indentured servants were starting to form the first versions of a union with the black slaves, with the African enslaved people. 
and because they wanted better uh, living quarters and they wanted um, to be paid better and they wanted to be treated better. And so they separated them from each other. The, the slave master, the plantation owners made a deal with the white indentured servants who were never going to get out of their indentured servant contract, by the way. So they were kind of, you know, low key enslaved, but being treated a little bit better. And so to, to um, prevent the white indentured poor white people who came to this country without money and who had to work for the plantation um, to pay off the voyage from Europe. And they would never get out of this because they would just keep on adding more and more uh, expenses. And so these people were told, we'll let you out of your debt or we will um, give you a little bit of money here if you will just separate yourself from them. Um, and also you will be punished if you don't separate yourself from them. We will treat you like we treat the enslaved people. So there wasn't much choice, was there? But this is how whiteness was created. Before that, Italian people were not considered white. Polish people were not considered white. Uh, people from any of the Slavic countries, by the way, that's, that's where the word slave comes from. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. From Slav, from Slavic. Oh. Yes, because the Slavic people were being enslaved in Europe. So there were European people that were not considered white. Um, they were considered separate. Irish people, I just put, I just shared on Facebook an article today um, that says that most Irish people are not of European descent, they're of Middle Eastern descent. <laughs> yeah, they're not Celts, they're not Celts. <laughs> I wanna, uh, first of all, are you okay with staying with us till 9.15? Sure. Um, I want to go back because we are celebrating you as an unsung hero and mm -hmm. you've paid a price for the work that you've done. That's a big part of being a hero. Um, and towards the beginning, you, there was a moment that I noticed where you talked about some of your loss, mm -hmm. some of what you've lost as a result of the work you do. And I would love for us as a grateful community to take a minute to just hold presence for that. Mm. Ask you about some of some Thank of the pain asking. or some of the loss that you've yeah. endured in order to do this work. Um, whew. Yeah. My, my life would be much simpler if I were not in a constant conversation with white people. Black people who were traumatized would trust me more if I were not in this conversation with white people. Um, being on a what I consider to be a sacred path, uh, a holy path, means that I have to let go of ego quite a lot and be more committed to integrity, which means that there are gonna be times when I'm wrong and I have to own that. I have to own my impact and own it openly and enthusiastically. So I've had to let go of the entitlement to, de to be defensive. I've had to let go of people who don't wanna have this conversation, people who um, would have otherwise said that they loved me, who when I created this course and invited them to take it, um, blocked me and have never spoken to me again. 
Wow. Yeah. That's happened. Um, allowing myself to be vulnerable and open and tell the stories I tell about my family's personal um, suffering is, is also a sacrifice because uh, how do I put this kindly? Um, you're not entitled to that. And there are people who actually, that's their kink is other people's suffering, you know? Um, there, there are people who actually get off on black suffering and think that they're good people, but they're actually just in this, I don't know how to explain it. There's this energetic um, addiction to people's suffering. And I've had to let go of, of my, uh, the impulse to lash out or the impulse to shut down and, st and stay in it. It's the same thing I'm asking everybody else to do is to stay in it. And if people have a, a problem with you um, wanting to do the right thing, let them go. I don't mean you have to kick them out of your life. They will leave on their own. I don't ever kick anybody out of my life, but there have been, people who were not okay with me being committed to this work and I had to let them go. Um, other things that for me, because I'm very results oriented, I'm, I very much want to see change happen in my lifetime. And it doesn't have to be complete obviously, but I want to experience the impact of my work. And so I have to be very committed to my integrity. And when you're very committed to your integrity, it is, uh, well, I'm also running a business mm -hmm. and I'm in a capitalist society. And the ways that you become successful are not always in alignment with my integrity. So um, I'm not getting rich. <laughs> This this show is about unsung heroes. I don't consider myself a, a hero, but I'm I'm definitely um, falling into the unsung category, and it's not because I'm not talented or um, engaging or um, magnifying uh, or magnetizing. I, I'm all of those things. Um, but I'm not willing to do certain things. Like I don't work with big corporations unless the actual owners of the corporation and their executives are willing to take the course just like everybody else. I don't go and do two hour seminars or talks at companies, even though I could make a lot of money that way. I don't do it because I know they're not actually about change. They're about performance. A lot of these companies do this so that they can uh, market, use it for marketing to say, look, we're an inclusive company or we're into, you know, equality or equity for all. And they're not really. We saw a great example of this was uh, when the two black men were arrested in Starbucks. And this all happened because Starbucks, that location had a, a rule about people hanging out and not buying anything. And uh, so they called the police on these two guys who were just, they were, they had a meeting and they were waiting for one other person before they started their meeting. And then they were going to order something to drink, but they were just waiting for their other person. They called the police on them and they were arrested and taken to the local jail. <laughs> these are businessmen Jeez. and they'd done nothing wrong. And the story unfolds that um, they created this rule that people can't hang out in the Starbucks because there were homeless people on the street who were coming in for shelter and hanging out in the bathrooms and shooting up in the in the bathrooms or whatever. And they were trying to keep those people out. 
think about that. You know, this is. <laughs> I, I want to um, remind you that the full title is Unsung Heroes Who Are Creating the New Paradigm. And uh, I'm going to let you get away with not owning that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because you truly are. You are helping to create the new yeah. paradigm. And and what's this show about? It's called The Awakening Earth. And it is all connected. Economic justice is essential if we truly are going to have a new world, if we are going to have a new paradigm, if we are going to have, um, and it's all connected. Climate yes. change is completely connected to social and racial and economic justice. It's Absolutely. All part of the whole package. Um, well, the same people who colonize also created the corporations that are ruining the planet. Right. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's part of the, that dominion over everything. A long time ago, there was a documentary that came out that really helped me to understand. It was called The Corporation. Mm -hmm. And it basically establishes that the entire, the, a corporate structure, the way corporations are built, they're completely sociopathic. A corporate oh, yeah. is Imperialism. a sociopathic entity. It yeah. is absolutely pathological. It has no care about seven generations forward or back. Well, it's all you got to do is do the math. Yeah. Like how much money does the owner of the company make versus how much actual physical energy do they have to put into that uh, product? And how much do the, the people who are making minimum wage? I mean, this conversation right now about um, raising the minimum wage to $15, I don't actually know how anyone could make $15 an hour and work 40 hour work week and survive on that. I don't know how that's working especially in bigger cities. Yep. So, you know, all, all of that stuff is, everything is, all of it's related. All of our pathologies are related and that we are not doing something about it is a part of it. We've been conditioned to not do anything about it. It's how it stays like this. And so, and, and you can really just look at what's happening in the world right now. The people who are actually speaking up are being called names and uh, insulted and even by people who would consider themselves liberal or nice or you know the good ones very uncomfortable with people who talk about the things that I talk about which is what makes you a hero I'm I'd like to show the last 10 minutes of my interview with Sharif I asked a couple of questions and I'd love your feedback on what he says uh, once before I had you and, and he on the show together, and I know you, you He's both have great. a very, yeah, you have a very common, uh, similar view. So let's, I, I did want to have a little bit of Sharif here. So um, let's do that. And then we're going to take a look at, the, at, at what you're doing. Your course. Awesome. We're almost out of time. And I have one last thought and question for you. Um, it's interesting that you chose Anwar Sadat because he was later assassinated for that very action that you described. Yeah. And so as we talk about becoming a colony, as we talk about this, are we willing to even give up our life to see the big picture to the degree that we're even willing to give up our life, whether it's you know figurative or even literal? Mm -hmm. And it seems that the only way that that can happen is when one reaches a state of oneness, where we realize I am not just this body, I am part of something far greater than this body. I am part, you know, and that's how people make sacrifice. That's how people make sacrifice and feel good about it. Yeah. Any so thoughts about how we can embrace, attain that state of oneness to the to the degree that we're willing to let go of our egoic desires, our personality desires, and truly shift to con colony thinking. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and I, in a way, I wish I started with that instead of ending with that, because 
what I want to share with you is, um, and I'll, I'll try to do this in a few minutes. Um, what I want to share with you is um, my lineage, the people I call my lineage, the people that their life and their life story um, fills me, uh, gives me the strength to keep going. Um, Gandhi is, uh, is one of those people. Uh, and I remember how he said, um, you may, you may take my life, but you will not get my obedience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead and kill me. You'll have my dead body, but not my obedience. Another person in my, in my lineage is uh, Martin Luther King. And really, unfortunately, and it's one of the things I'm I'm sad about is that when King was alive, he wasn't. I was critical of him. I saw nonviolence as weakness, mm -hmm. and I and I, I I developed the the sight to be able to see nonviolence as the ultimate power. To be able to stand, and I've done this before, stand in front of a person who's aiming a machine gun at me, mm. giving me an order in a language I didn't know. I had no idea what he was saying. Yeah, I didn't know whether he was saying stand up or sit down. And to recognize this might be my time to go, but I know that I've got a time to go. So I'm gonna be at peace, whether it's today, you know, I could get in a car accident tonight, I could get assassinated 10 years from now. Whatever it is, I'm going to be at peace. And another person who has been in my, my lineage is Václav Havel, uh, who was a dissident in a Soviet prison. And because of the Velvet Revolution, they dusted him off, put a suit on him, and he became the president of the country. So while Havel was still in the prison, pushing around the laundry carts, he ran into another prisoner. The, he didn't know the other guy was even in the prison. And they had five or 10 minutes to talk to each other before the guards would break him up. So what would you and I talk about in, when we're uh, in a prison to, for our beliefs? You could talk about how bad the food is, how much you miss your wife, how brutal the guards are. You could focus on all the negatives. For five minutes, Havel and this other guy focused on the nature of the society they would create when they got out. Havel was taken out and was made the president. The other guy was taken out and made the foreign secretary. So we can build that society right now or we can waste all of our time looking at all of the problems looking at donald trump looking at uh, things that will produce nothing that you actually want and then my final um uh, uh part of my lineage my final hero is uh, nelson mandela and to the idea of enduring the pain, the separation, 28 years in uh, solitary confinement, not seeing another human being except the guards that are brutalizing you, and getting out of there and smiling. Okay. Um, there's a story um, that uh, when, when, when Mandela was president, there's a restaurant he liked eating at. And so He'd go to the restaurant and everybody, oh, Mandela, Mandela. And um, he'd get his food and he's sitting with his uh, security guards. Uh, there's a white guy in the restaurant. And Mandela told um, his security guard to go over and ask that white guy to sit at his table and eat. So he sat down at the table and you, could, and, and, and you could tell the guy was really anxious and upset. And, you know, they all, you know, they ate their food. They didn't, they weren't talking. And 
um, they, they paid for it, paid for his, and said goodbye. And his, guard, his security guard said, well, what was that about? And he said, this guy, the guy that just, he just ate dinner with, was uh, one of the guards at Robben Island. And one of the guards that beat him and brutalized him. And at this, after the, 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 this one um, time that he was beaten, he said, he, he was so thirsty, he said, I just, I need a drink of water, just a, a cup of water. And so the guy urinated on him. Now, you're the president of the country. You can do anything you want. He could have sent his security folks over and say, arrest that guy for something. <laughs> and we'll figure it out later. And, and that'll be, you know, that'll be his punishment. But if he had punished him, that punishment would have damaged Mandela's heart. And because of that, he was able to liberate his own heart. Whether, whether the guy got it or not didn't matter. This was an exercise in his heart. So the four guys that, that put me in the hospital, the four police officers that put me in the hospital, I had to let them go. And once I let them go, my heart expands. I don't know what happened to their hearts, okay? But the bottom line is mine expanded and needs all the expansion it can get. And so the, the, uh, the challenge is, can all of us do that? Can all of us do that expansion in a society that actually celebrates your pain? Can we celebrate our liberation from pain, from suffering? Uh, and I think that becomes our challenge. Well, thank you as always for beautiful stories, powerful insights, and for painting a picture of a, a positive future for our world. And, that's why I think, you know, we call it the awakening world and you describe the steps <clears throat> necessary for us to create that awakening world with eloquence and inspiration. Thank you so much, Sharif. And again, um, I will you know, take people to your website, Commonwealth, and we'll take a look at the new book and all that you are doing. Thank you so much, my friend. For well, you thank you. And um, it's been my pleasure. It's been my heart opening to do this. And um, we'll, we'll chat some more. We'll do it again. Absolutely. Uh, powerful stories, huh? Yes. So you're putting me on the spot right now, Scott. You're putting me on the spot. And I'm just going to stay in the... Um, in the mindset of intimacy with this. First of all, um, what he's saying there is very nuanced. And I'm imagining for white people hearing what he's saying, this sounds very good. This sounds wonderful, yes? And it's also true that the reason there are only five <laughs> countries on the planet that are not, um, that have not been dominated by colonization is because they showed up in that way. Okay. Um, I happen to think, as I said at the beginning, we have access to our full range of expression. If you study martial arts, martial arts is not meant to be used in sinister ways. It's not meant to be used for vengeance. It's not meant to be used for um, malice or contempt. It is meant to be two things. First of all, self-discipline. And secondly, um, self-defense. The ability and confidence to be in your skin, in your body, and uh, be sovereign 
in your personal space and to have the confidence to move in a way that preserves your life and possibly even the life of the other person, okay? And it is fighting. Um, a lot of people don't know this because it's not talked about, but Martin Luther King had armed guards the day he was shot. Martin Luther King moved through the world with armed guards. And he had been for several years prior to being killed. Martin Luther King, I'm gonna say it again, he had armed guards <laughs> with machine guns. Um, so uh, this idea that um, nonviolence is nonviolent is not really completely true, is it? It's um, from an individual uh, place of preservation, however, I can preserve my peace, preserve my righteousness, and defend myself at the same time. Well, Marshall Rosenberg calls that the protective use of force. Yeah. And so it is important to recognize that it's not get slapped, turn the other cheek, and get slapped again. That right. does mean we know where that comes from. <laughs> exactly. um, no, it's it's about the, there is the protective use of force. Um, and yeah, I, I just think I, I'm trying to, you know, really think of myself as not separate from the rest of the animal kingdom. I want to think of myself as a part of nature and all beings in nature have forms of self-defense. And we have been trained to not defend ourselves. And this, this nuanced thing that he's describing, I, I think it's, we have to be careful about the context in which we talk about it. Because from a place of, of, of being healed, of doing some significant, substantial amount of personal development and spiritual work, that's awesome. Like I can sit in the middle of a storm and be at peace. And not and not be um, uh, compromised internally, but that comp that is not a you cannot bypass. You're also still in your body. You're also a human being in a body, and you have a life that's worth something. And this idea that the spiritual and the physical and the mental are separate things is is a miseducation. Spirit is in everything. So your life is spiritual. Your body is spiritual. A tree is spiritual. The wind is spiritual. And my concept of God is that God is the accumulative sum of everything. So everything is holy. Everything is sacred. And when we are numbed out or repressed to the extent that we do not defend our, our own life, we're in trouble. And, and if, we're, if you have no, listen, the Native Americans didn't, they were not um, <laughs> expecting what came upon them. And so when the Europeans arrived, they invited, they welcomed them in. You know about that famous letter that Columbus wrote um, mm -hmm. after where he talks about how beautiful they are, how generous they are, and then closes by saying that it will be very easy to subjugate and enslave these people because yes. they're so, it's like the most heartbreaking. Yeah. Thing so, as, as romantic as the idea of nonviolence is, and as much as I am a believer in nonviolence, I, I, I am not um, in any way um, deluded to think that um, it is the only solution or even half of the solution. You know, we have to be dynamic and be able to discern what's appropriate in each situation. Every situation does not require violence. And because we are desperate 
and we don't even know we're desperate. <laughs> we're, we're starving for correction and we don't even know we're starving for it. Um, when something gets triggered, there's immediately violence because we're so oppressed emotionally, spiritually, and physically. So kind of the question that I asked him, I wanna ask you, do you believe that ultimately it is we have to be able to achieve some form of oneness, whether it's from a spiritual level or an intellectual level, that when I look at you, I don't just see a black woman, but I do see my sister. And that I do recognize that your needs are just as important as my needs. And it's not just an intellectual idea, but something that I've truly embraced as a consciousness. Yeah, this is why I talk about the spirit not being separate from the physical plane. Everything is one. We are taught to visualize in our minds these different planes of existence as separate, but they are not. In me metaphysics, we actually learn about how all, everything is one. So even consciousness is, is one with everything. So, um, so I use semantics a little bit differently. I use words a little differently. When I talk about love, for, exa for example, I speak of the state of being that is love. And what I believe that to be is that love is the, uh, is, is the oneness, right? And when we feel love towards another person, what we're feeling is present to that oneness. We are experience the oneness which usually means that we've somehow stripped away a bunch of stuff that's in the way of us experiencing that with each other, like differences. And, and that doesn't mean that the, different, the differences aren't there. Like, I know that we're one. Uh, also, study a little bit of physics. I mean, science will teach you that everything is one. There is there's a conundrum there. There's a, a, a paradox that everything has a little bit of space between it. You know, every particle of anything has a little bit of space between it, but everything is also touching. Both are true at the same time. We are all connected. Cause and effect is a law of nature. So there is no separation. We are all connected. And by the way, we have the ability to see ourselves as individuals. That is a part of our mental construct, our mental design, that we're able to see patterns, that I can tell the difference between my desk and the computer is the cognitive ability to see a, a pattern, a shape, right? And so we have that ability to distinguish between you and me, but we also have the ability to consider ourselves as one. But we've been taught in this society to focus on the separation between us, which completely removes us from consciousness. Um, uh, when something happens to another person on the other side of the country and it's allowed to happen and there are no um, consequences for it and, um, and, and it's not treated as if it were wrong. Uh, it's it's going to continue. And eventually it's going to come in your neighborhood. Um, growing up, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, 60s and 70s. And so my generation of, of Black kids uh, were always taught that, you know, in order to overcome oppression in an oppressive society, you have to be a model citizen. You have to be uh, extremely successful. You have to make a lot of money. You have to uh, gain respect by being super civilized, like the European folks are civilized. And you have to wear your hair neat and not be uh, an artist and you cannot dissent anything and you have to be well-behaved and never, you know, all of this stuff, right? Well, <laughs> what's left of me after all of that? So how, how, do I, um, how do I show up in the world and 
connect with you when we're both brainwashed to think of ourselves as individuals for the purpose of serving the elite and of being disposable. Our individualism makes us disposable. It makes us fungible. If we consider ourselves one, we understand something very clear. If there is a disrespect of life, if there is um, a paradigm, a way of thinking, a belief that it's okay to harm or marginalize or disenfranchise or discriminate against one group of people, then there is an overall paradigm that that sort of container is acceptable. What that means is it could happen to any of us because there's no scientific uh, chemical thing happening there. It's a, it's a construct. Um, so for example, if, if you believe that, uh, let's say you lie to me, okay? And, and because I'm sensitive about being lied to, I decide from that day forward, I'm not going to trust another man ever again because men are liars because you lied to me, right? So I will go through the world with that as a paradigm in my head. Um, let's say, uh, and I will, and I, and my psyche will create situations to reinforce that. Right, to collect evidence to support that painful belief. Right. And as well, let's flip the coin over. If I steal from people, I'm constantly going to be uh, thinking that I'm going to be stolen from. Mm -hmm. If I am the liar, I'm, I, I have created a paradigm in my head that lying is an acceptable behavior, then I've got to imagine that everybody else is lying to me. We're not separate. It is scientifically not true. We have limbic systems that uh, on the mental plane, we're connected even. It's why if someone sings a sad song, you can feel the emotion of it. Or if, if you're um, intimate with someone and they're expressing something deeply intimate, you can feel, I mean, physically you feel it. You might have tightness in your chest or goosebumps or the hairs on the back of your neck raise. We are not separate. Pheromones. We've discovered that pheromones <laughs> talk to each other. When people yes. are creation age, if they are a good DNA genetic match to make a healthy baby, the pheromones say, hey, let's make a baby. And that's what we call sexual chemistry. Yes. There's so many levels. I, I, I want to share one thing. You may know this one, but I want to share it. And then we got to wrap up the show. Um, about one of the um, most ancient sacred texts that has survived, that's not sitting in the basement of the Vatican somewhere, um, are the Vedic scriptures written mm -hmm. in Sanskrit about 7,000 years ago. And in the Vedic scriptures, God is called Brahman. Mm -hmm. And there are 26 principles assigned to Brahman. Fast forward 7,000 years to today. And of course, our most modern science is quantum physics, which I know you're very familiar with. And in quantum physics, we've proven scientifically that we're living in a unified field of ever-changing molecules. Yes. Guess what? they have scientifically determined that there are 26 principles of the unified field. Mm -hmm. 26 principles perfectly correlate with the 26 definitions of Brahman, which means that our most ancient spiritual wisdom and our most modern science are saying the exact same. Well, this is, this is exactly why I became a metaphysician. I, um, at, at some point about 14 years ago, I had some very chronic back pain. And the thing that improved that for me was um, this machine called a TENS machine. And it's vibration. Basically, it's, it's administering frequencies into the muscles in my back. And within weeks, I had no more pain after years of chronic pain. And 
So I started to study, what is this frequency stuff about? And then I found, I found that this technology was used in ancient Egypt long before uh, there, anybody knew how to create electronical things that, <laughs> you know, that we're using now for that kind of stuff. And um, that the Gregorian chants were um, tuned to these frequencies that are now being used to repair DNA. And yeah, <laughs> and that um, at some point in, well, I'm not gonna lie right now. I can't remember what year it was. There was a king in, in uh, England who decided that he no longer wanted the masses, the, the common folk to have access to this frequency stuff. And so they changed the tuning of the Gregorian chants. Wow. Um, the, those chants were based on what's called the solfeggio. And the solfeggio is a scale that y'all might recognize as do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Well, each of those um, syllables is the first syllable in a line of a hymn from the, from the Catholic church from back in the day. And they changed the tuning so that you and I would not be able to use that medicine for, on our own. We have to depend on the church for that. And all Western instruments from that day forward were tuned off from those frequent frequencies. So you have to either use um, Eastern instruments or some kind of technology to create music using those healing frequencies now. I noticed that our beloved brother, Omar who is going to play a closing song for us, put that into the chat box uh, about Cervasio. So, yeah. All right. We could go for hours. Um, and <laughs> I, I want to acknowledge all the wonderful dialogue going on in the chat box. Uh, I will save the chat for you um, and send it to you. Rich. Oh, awesome. And yeah, I, I can't read and talk at the same time, y'all. I apologize, but I really I send it to you. There's beautiful things. And let's talk about your work. Um, so again, I put it in the chat box a couple of times. Those of you watching on Facebook, go to the Remember Institute, rememberinstitute.com. Um, here was his menu, click courses. And please tell us you've got two courses that I want you to tell us. Uh, let's start with the Heal Thyself uh, course. Yeah, so Heal Thyself is the course that we were speaking about um, where we talk about, it's actually called Heal Thyself Transformative Initiation for People Racialized as White. And it's a six week course. It's highly demanding. There's reading to do, there's um, videos to watch. And then there's discussions. We also have a couple of group activities that help people to um, identify their bias and also to identify their conflict resolution style. We're, we're trying to cover as much as we can in this one course so that people feel equipped enough to begin a journey um, that transforms themselves, their lifestyle and, and everything. So that's Heal Thyself. That's the course that Trish first took. Yes. And she's not the same human being. I mean, I, I knew her before and after. And we were spending a lot of time around the time that she was taking that course. She couldn't talk about anything else. She couldn't mm -hmm. think about anything else. It so changed and rewired her brain. And she's a different human being. And her yeah. whole focus in life has changed because of that course. And we've put it, we've put about, I would say probably 350 people through that course at this point. And we have seen dr people make really dramatic changes. And earlier you made a comment about, uh, you know, are you willing to, to risk your life? Are you willing to, what are you willing to die for? What are you willing to sacrifice? And we've seen people take this course and then make really powerful changes in their lives and, and, you know, using their privilege to help others. Um, in ways that actually all of a sudden they realize that, oh, this is how I actually find satisfaction for myself is by relinquishing some of that comfort and getting in the trenches 
um, to help others who are being discarded. Um, so that's that's heal thyself. Uh, we also, once you take that course, you are invited to our alumni community and the alumni community, they're, they're working on all kinds of projects in their local areas. And we have a discussion group on Facebook where people can ask questions if they are having some sort of conflict or challenge with having these conversations. Um, and we also keep an archive of media and book uh, recommendations and things like that for our alumni. Um, and then we have the holistic business um, practices for people who've taken the Heal Thyself course. If you have a business of your own, um, you can take the holistic business practices course, which is an, another layer of uh, disruption or dismantling uh, racism. Um, but the other the other course that I wanted to highlight would be the Initiates Path. This is a three year long uh, program broken down into three separate phases. And this is foundational. Everything that I do is based on the teachings that I'm teaching in this particular path. Um, Initiates Path teaches Hermeticism. Uh, we cover the Course in Miracles. We read the Kibalion. Um, We are studying Franz Bardone's uh, Hermetic uh, alchemy and, and initiation. Um, we study the Quadrivium, which is the four basic liberal arts of number, geometry, language. What's the other one? <laughs> and music. <laughs> um, it's a it's a very in depth. It's it's sort of like wizard school, but it's not at all like wizard school because I'm not a wizard, and <laughs> it's it's more rooted in African tradition. The Kabbalion is a book of um, nine uh, seven principles that are ba based on. Uh, principles authored by Thoth, who was uh, one of the ancient fathers of the scribes of Egypt, um, and most of our science and philosophy is based on those seven principles. So we we are teaching this so that people have access to this information that this particular British king didn't want people to have, and wow. so we are giving it back to the people. It is actually available to anyone, but in this form, the way that we're we're doing it is in a class, in a group where people can study and explore together and then put things into practice. It is fantastic. I'm really enjoying it myself. Um, so yeah, we I invite people, we start the next phase one for Initiates Path in March of next year, but we are already accepting applications. And um, I do recommend very highly that you do the uh, Heal Thyself course prior to that. If you want, if you're in interested in Initiates Path, do the Heal Thyself course first. It will make a difference. It'll change your life, everybody. I, as I said before, I've watched that happen with Trish. Reverend Bridge, thank you so much. Thank you to your husband. I met, I did meet her husband briefly. <laughs> um, and so thank you for letting uh, us have two hours of your time. Oh, it's my pleasure. Your wisdom pleasure. and your compassion. I do want to ask one last question. I know I, you did that you have hope. And um, we have so far to go. And there's so much lost of illusion. But what's one thing you can share that does give you hope? for our future. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't typically use the word hope because for me when I think about hope I think about powerlessness and just being like, well, hopefully it'll work out. Hopefully she will say but I'm going to tell you this. Here's here's what I'll say. I believe in possibility. Okay? So I I live for possibility. What's possible? And then beyond that, what's probable? It is probable that humanity is going to evolve. 
Um, and if that's going to happen, how can I put myself in the in the flow of that rather than a, against the flow? How can I position myself to minimize my own suffering and to inspire others to minimize their suffering by being in the flow of evolution, which, which is our betterment? Anything else that has evolved has evolved in order to survive, not to die. So in the ways that, that um, we are seeing things crumbling or falling apart, some of that needs to happen. Some things have to die off. And, and that gives me um, confidence. I'm not going to say hope because I don't really like the word hope. It gives me the confidence and the inspiration to get myself more in, in alignment, more in flow with, um, with the change that's happening. And so I'm inspired by that. I don't think we have a choice. I actually think that um, for me, uh, as a former uh, sufferer of depression, uh, the concept that I would be, um, that I would imagine some sort of apocalyptic, tragic ending to humanity, uh, what do we, how do we continue to live if we give into that? So I want to, I want to imagine my grandchildren and I want to imagine um, us becoming even more magnificent. Hum humanity is really quite beautiful and uh, yes, we're ugly too <laughs> and we're getting better. I believe we're getting better. And yes, we've had some hiccups. We've tried some things that don't work and we've allowed some things uh, with to be done by some folks who actually don't really care about being aligned with nature. As far as they're concerned, they'll buy, buy another planet and move there when they're done with this one, right? So um, I am here in the moment, practicing putting myself more and more in alignment. Okay. And feeling the reward of that in the now. Because what that does for me is tell me what's that that there's possibility that I can't see. Mm. So that's that's what I do. That's how I process instead of um, hope. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, Bridge, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, beautiful comments. I, you know, I'm. And yes, I love the pointing, they're pointing out that beautiful row, nursery rhyme that's so beautiful. Row, row, row your boat. Yes. Down the stream. Merrily, merrily, merrily. Because life is better. Life is just a dream. Hey, we, this uh, dream life is going to continue with some more unsung heroes this weekend. Uh, tomorrow night, um, we're going to have an amazing scientist, Paul Mills. Mm. And his story is very beautiful. Uh, Chief Phil Lane, one of our favorite, um, he's like a Reverend Bridge and uh, uh, Sharif. He's beloved and he's going to be with us tomorrow night. John Martin, who does such amazing, beautiful work, will be with us. And we're going to be honoring the goddess Sophia. This mm -hmm. weekend is when people celebrate the descent of Sophia. We have two scholars with us, Daniel Morse, who wrote the book about the goddess Sophia, and Diana Kelly, and those, another scholar. So it's going to be a, a different, she's an unsung hero of the archetypal type. Um, That's then, very important work, y'all. That's the, the, the other thing I did not mention is it's important for people racialized as white to study pre-Roman uh, traditions of their the tribes of, of Europe. Europe has indigenous tribes. <laughs> so. what a, a beautiful show all about the black lilith um that was really yeah. fast um, so we're, we're doing our best to get that into the awakening world beautiful and finally on sunday morning uh we're going down to ecuador um at least via zoom uh shri and kira ra and they have built this incredible pyramid they are working with the indigenous people um uh embracing their wisdom um working with the pachamama foundation and it's going to be really powerful, uh, all about unifying through peace and celebrating, getting ready to celebrate Peace Week, 
which starts next weekend, including a whole week of shows on that and the September equinox. So, um, and beloved brother Omashar is with us always. And thank you, Omashar, for staying with us uh, because we love to begin and end our shows with his music. <clears throat> okay. Um, Omashar, what stands out for you tonight? Holy smoke, Reverend Bridge, thank you so much. It's like um, the words that you put out there um, uh, are just burning through my consciousness. It's just a light. Um, I, I, uh, I, I take the words and um, it just kind of stimulates places in me where I've had resistance, actually. And uh, because we all have our own perspectives, there is, there is many perspectives on this planet as there are beings on this planet. We know that one. Um, Indeed. However, they all emanate from the same source. And once we get back onto that same page, everything will be just perfect. And, uh, um, you know, uh, and so for me, um, I, 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 as I let the light into my being, everything which is out of balance gets highlighted mm. with myself. And I can only be true to myself and work with myself. And so thank you for being a vehicle this night for that. And I have a song which I'm going to sing now, which I was almost not going to sing because when it gets late, I think everyone's going to be in bed <clears throat> and um, um, whatever. It's called Beloved. And it's about when I, when I was first awakening and letting the light in, into my body, into my mind, into my psyche, into my feelings, into my heart. Um, I, I found I couldn't talk with anybody about it because I just thought I was woo-woo and out there, and uh, which is also true. However, um, I'm not out there. I'm actually in here. In there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'll, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting nervous as I do when, I, when I, uh, I'm about to play. So I'll just play it. And um, it's quite an epic song and you can move to it. It's not too long, but um, long enough uh, for me to be. Jeffrey Colbrook, dance away. We are, we're, Jeffrey always is good at leading, uh, leading the church to dancing.
Thank you, thank you. I'm going to bring awesome. Reverend Bridge back up. I love it. <laughs> That's a trip to um, a trip to play too, because I'm in a house now and everyone's asleep, and I'm spouting out this song, expecting <laughs> <laughs> the neighbors to knock on the door and go, "Shut up!" Um, anyway, awesome. you know, she heard was coming over, and she came jump. She came up and said, "Okay, Dad, I want to be up there too." So, oh. All right, well, thank you again, Reverend Bridge, for giving us so much beautiful wisdom. Well, it's my pleasure always to come and share some time with you, time and space, and get to know some of your friends and have them get to know me a little bit. It's nice to be here always. So thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. I will send you the chat because you'll appreciate all the comments coming. Very in. cool. Thank you. And I sure hope you find me, by the way, on, on Facebook as well. Okay. And uh, yeah, if, if you want more. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you under Reverend Bridge Feltus or Bridge Feltus? Uh, just uh, Bridge Feltus, B R I G F E L T U S. Yeah, let me find it. I'll find it real quickly. And that way I can show it to people. Uh, here we go. There you are. We're friends on Facebook. Of course uh, we are. Uh, all right, here we go. There we go. So everybody, you can find her on Facebook. Yes, I'm constantly posting things from the news and my take on things happening in the world. So it's a good place to kind of get a feeling for my perspective and how I'm teaching um, just by following me on Facebook. Well, thank you for a beautiful, beautiful start to our incredible Unsung Hero series. Um, everybody join us tomorrow night. John Martin, Chief Phil Lane, Paul Mills, Music with Omastar and Jamishka. Uh, the band Jamishka is gonna be back with us and they're great. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and then, of course, on Sunday, going down to Ecuador. Have a wonderful, one, wonderful weekend, everybody. Hope to see you tomorrow night. And thank you again, Reverend Bridge, for your beautiful work. Blessings, everyone.